Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Flannery, and I'm a first year Doctor of Public Health student at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. It is a privilege to introduce Dr. Atul Gawande. Dr. Gawande practices general and endocrine surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He is a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and in the Department of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Gawande is also the Executive Director of Ariadna Labs, a joint center for health systems innovation, and the founder and chairman of the Lifebox Foundation, a nonprofit working to reduce surgery deaths globally. Dr. Gawande's academic work includes extensively published research on surgery and healthcare. Since 2007, Dr. Gawande has led the World Health Organization's Safe Surgery Saves Lives program. Along with his notable medical and academic accomplishments, Dr. Gawande is best known for his notable writing. He has written four best-selling books and has been a staff writer for the New Yorker magazine since 1998. Dr. Gawande recalls that early in his career, he struggled with writing. However, he has since earned two National Magazine Awards and the Lewis Thomas Award for Writing and Science. In 2006, Dr. Gawande received a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, known as a Genius Grant. His work and writings have made significant contributions to the field and public discourse on medical practice, ethics, and healthcare. Dr. Gawande's most recent book, Being Mortal, Medicine and What Matters in the End, was published in October of 2014 and quickly rose to the number one New York Times bestseller and remains among the top 10 best-selling nonfiction books. The extensively researched book is making phenomenal contributions to the national conversation on end-of-life care. In February of 2015, PBS Frontline turned the book into a widely acclaimed documentary. Dr. Gawande's path is as full and diverse as his current career. He earned his medical degree from Harvard Medical School in 1995 after a brief absence to work as a healthcare advisor to Bill Clinton. He then earned a Master of Public Health degree from Harvard School of Public Health in 1999. Before I turn the session over to our moderator today, Dr. Lucian Leap, Professor of Health Policy, please join me in welcoming Dr. Atul Gawande to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Well, I want to add my welcome to Tool. It's just a delight to have you here. I've watched your career for a long time, and it's inspired so many people. So it's great to have an opportunity to put you on the spot and see <laughs> what, that, what really makes you tick. Uh, and we, that may be a place to start. You've had an interesting uh, trajectory. Um, you graduated St Stanford. You were a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, graduated from Harvard Medical School. But I noticed that in that sequence, it took you a long time to graduate from Harvard Medical School. There were about six or seven years in there. So you were doing something else. Do you want to tell us what you were doing and why? <laughs> <laughs> well, so first of all, I should uh, uh, confess that Lucian has been a mentor, mentor of mine from the moment I came to the School of Public Health. So it's fun to get to talk with you as a fellow surgeon, a pediatric surgeon, who had gone into public health. So um, it's, uh, and I think that pathway is as convoluted as um, if in your life as it has been in mine. I was in medical school after um, taking five years to even decide I was gonna get there. Um, I had taken a pathway that, um, where I did two years in politics and philosophy at Oxford. I'd hoped that I might become a philosopher and do a PhD in philosophy, but I found I couldn't really um, understand the questions the philosophers were asking, <laughs> let alone offer anything in the way of original answers. Um, and so I stuck with the masters. <laughs> and, then, um, and then I worked in politics for a while. So I worked on Al Gore's presidential campaign back in 1988, uh, short-lived campaign. People may not remember, but it was uh, his admission of having smoked pot at, at, here at Harvard that um, contributed to his having to walk away from that campaign at the time. The world changed by 1992. Um, and I had started uh, medical school uh, when I was working in politics, I'd worked on uh, a health plan with a 
um, a Southern Democrat uh, named Jim Cooper representing Tennessee. I'd worked for him for about a year and a half. And so when I started medical school, um, the plan was that, uh, you know, this is what I'm going to stick with. But um, health reform became an issue in the 92 election, enough that when Bill Clinton ran, um, his uh, head of policy asked if I would join the team as um, a, their health policy advisor and social policy advisor. So, you know, I think I was probably number 32 on the list of people they asked. <laughs> By the time, at that point, I was 26 years old, um, but the job required you to move to Little Rock, Arkansas. This was during the primaries. Clinton was uh, not even in the top two at that time of seven Democrats running. They were called the Seven Dwarves because Bush Sr. had 70% favorability ratings. So, you know, by the, I was asked to join. Um, and for me, it was an amazing opportunity, and I believed in Bill Clinton. I'd met him during the time when he was governor, when we were crafting a, um, uh, a health plan that Southern Democrats could sign on to. And so I took a leave of absence from medical school. Um, it ended up being almost two years uh, because, lo and behold, we won the primary. Um, I had proposed to my now wife at that time, and I, she, she had moved up to Boston. I said, well, they got this job offer. Don't worry. We'll lose before we get out of the primary. And then we won the primary and go into the general election. I said to her, well, we're supposed to get married two weeks after the election. Don't worry about it. We're going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> It'll work out fine. And then just one thing led to another <laughs> until finally um, in, uh, uh, ended up working in the White House and in the Department of Health and Human Services. And then I made the decision after health reform went down um, the, uh, the head of the welfare reform effort was David Elwood, who is now the dean of the Kennedy School of Government. Um, and he had asked if I would join the team to work on welfare reform. And I decided I need, needed to forge my own set of skills. Um, it was a hard decision. The group of people I was with, um, you know, there was a bunch of us who were young people working on policy. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I didn't love the ups and downs of the sharp political elbows, people you agree with who would muscle you out of meetings, um, you know, playing that, that game. And I didn't know how I felt about working exclusively in my career for politicians. So I decided to go back and, uh, and complete medical school. I'd lost some ground and had to make it up. Um, but that's what I came back to do. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I think I first met you when you were uh, in the middle of your surgical residency. <clears throat> you were spending some time over here working on the medical practice study follow-up. Um, but that was the first time I recognized that you had some interest in safety. But how did you get an interest in patient safety? How did that fit in with this? It was you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have a particular interest and in focus on medical error. but. Um, I was interested in identifying problems that we could solve, and I had started a set of studies um, that was in uh, with another mentor, Troy Brennan, who was here um, at the School of Public Health at the time. He was a lawyer doing medical research on malpractice with you, and the follow-up study that he's describing was one where we had data from Utah and Colorado across hospitals, 15,000 patients in hospitals across the state. And I was in charge of looking at the surgical data. And what I was interested in is how much of the people who die was because they had complications of care where we just didn't know the answers. And the problem is ignorance. And we need to overcome that with more scientific research around in the bench lab. And how much was because the, they just didn't execute, that there was knowledge that existed, but people died from complications that could have been prevented. And we found that two-thirds of the surgical deaths were from really error, and that they accounted for also two-thirds of the deaths in hospitals in the state. So that's when I came, started tagging along with you, and you were running a program at the Kennedy School of Government right. that were bringing civic leaders together, not just medical leaders, but people from politics and a wide variety of fields saying, 
what do we do about this problem that you recognized years before? And um, you got me interested. <laughs> I'll take full credit. <laughs> well, we, we want to talk about your By the way, I want to point out, though, yes. you brought me along as a brand new student at the School of Public Health. Everybody else in the room were people with an enormous amount of experience, and just getting to be in there, that's what made it possible. Yeah, well, it, it, was, it was certainly a very good investment, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. We want to talk about your leadership in all three areas that you've excelled in, in writing, in research, and in surgery. And, uh, and I think writing is the logical place to start because that's where most people are familiar with your work. And I must say, I'll never forget the first piece of yours in the New Yorker that I read. I, I don't think it was your first piece, but it was called The Learning Curve. And uh, you described uh, the experience you had um, in learning how to insert a central line. This is putting a big needle in somebody's neck and trying to find the vein. And I was reading this, and I, as, as, as your description of it, of how frustrating it was, and your, how your, your, you were frightened, and you, were, you weren't sure what was going to happen next. And I was reading this and saying, yes, yes, that's just the way it is. And then I realized I was sweating. And I said, this is somebody who really knows how to write. <laughs> and so let's ask you that question. Um, this was, a, you, you started writing from New Yorker just about the same time you were over here looking at patient safety. Are they related? And more importantly, how did you get started writing from New Yorker? And how did you learn to write so well? <laughs> <laughs> um, I did not have a plan. It was not clearly related at all. Um, I have always had a, um, a variety of interests. I never thought writing would be one of them. Um, I had my worst grades in, in college were in writing. Um, and well, there's a take-home lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I, I think I didn't have anything to write about is the most important thing. I had nothing to say. Um, in surgical residency, forged by fire, then getting a chance to pull back and think about it in a public health atmosphere where you're thinking about, you know, how do we solve problems for entire populations? It, um, writing was the way that I could stay connected as a surgery resident, um, stay connected to public policy issues without having to be full-time. You know, like being in politics is a full-time sport. You have to be there day in, day out. You know, um, my wife thought that surgical residency was a um, was better for her life than being in politics. We got two days off in the entire year, uh, uh, in an entire year working in that world. And um, so the bottom line for me was that um, writing started out as just an experiment. A friend of mine had started an internet magazine. This was 1996 when it was the Netscape browser, if any of you remember that. So you know, you'd literally get if you're lucky, hundreds of hits. <laughs> and for me, where I was a terrible writer, that was beautiful. I could almost do it in obscurity. But I was working with a friend who'd been in journalism a long time. And he and the people he gathered were fantastic editors. And so I wrote a series of what you'd now call blogs. We called them a column then. But I had editing. So it was like getting to do 30 gallbladders in a row with a surgeon standing across the table from you. I did 30 columns in a row with really great editors telling me, this is what you're doing well, this is what you're not doing well, and boy, that argument is really pretty weak. <laughs> and let's see if you can make it better. I was forced to revise. I never revised anything. You know, I had to learn how to really revise. And so when um, it was more happenstance than anything, it started as really being about public policy issues. My first article, one of my first articles was about Governor George W. Bush and a policy he had signed into law in Texas allowing criminals to be freed if they agreed to castration, if they had been rapists or, or convicted of um, child molestation. It's like, yeah, what do we think of that policy? <laughs> but it morphed into talking about um, my own um, experiences in recognize, dealing with errors, understanding how you deal with imperfection in medicine, and thinking about some of these other kinds of issues. And so you know, it was the influence of being in this mix of the different things I was working on, on the research side, living a life of trying to learn how to be a surgeon, um, and thinking about public policy that kind of forged a series of articles in The New Yorker. It turned out that as the magazine grew, it was Slate Magazine, 
Slate went from a few hundred hits to by the time I finished in two years, it was 300,000 hits per article. And among those that was reading it was a uh, New, York, New Yorker editor who offered the chance to try writing for them. And um, I started with small articles, and it, and it grew over time. You once said you, you revised your first New Yorker article a number of times. 22 times. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it would you know, be a couple months of work. It was nine months of work, going back and back and back. And, um, you know, but I had to admit, it kept getting better. So it was painful, but the editor would keep throwing me another task, and it would keep making the article better. better so, fantastic. We went, I, that was, I think, the key difference. Was I learned, I'm an okay writer with a first draft, but I learned how to revise to get it to the point that I could be um, a really uh, a much stronger, more vivid writer, and make it sound like conversation. And that takes a lot of cutting, 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 rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. I think it was James Missioner who somebody said, you're a great writer. He says, no, I'm a great rewriter. <laughs> Sounds like you're in the same club. <laughs> Trying to learn to do that, right. yes. <laughs> now, the other two big areas uh, that you've contributed so much in are uh, research and surgery, and they came together uh, when the World Health Organization asked you to uh, run a safe, safer surgery project. I remember you came in to me and said, what do you think about this? And I said, well, the WHO is not the easiest place to work with. On the other hand, big, big possibility for making an impact. And you decided to do it. And, um, and I, I think it would be very interesting for people to understand not only what led you to make that decision, but more importantly in terms of the leadership aspect, how you were able to corral a group of surgeons of all people from around the world and get them to focus how you came to a, a conclusion about what to do, and, uh, and what were the, the challenges and uh, the leadership challenges in, in carrying that thing off? Yeah, and I, for me, it was an evolving sense of what, what was going to be the way that I learned to lead. I think a lot of my thinking coming out of government and politics and then my initial writing was that where change occurs was really around laws and policy and regulations and trying to move those needles. But many of the problems I felt like we saw in making um, equitable, high-quality health care that could reach a large number of people was that there were many problems that simply hadn't been solved or accepted or agreed upon even by the profession. And so the World Health Organization asked me to take on this project, which was to see if we could reduce deaths in surgery globally. And I was still in the back of my mind thinking that this might be about policies or things like that. Uh, we launched into the project. It was not funded very well. It was um, a small amount of money to con convene a lot of um, leaders in and around surgery and um, try to make a kind of set of guidelines about care. But what was clear with the team that I assembled is we all wanted to actually see whatever we did make a difference. So we're going to go to all this work and if it doesn't, if it just sits on a shelf somewhere as a book of guidelines, that's, that doesn't get anywhere. And the more we dug into it, the more we felt and that the problems were not ones of policy, but how to reduce deaths in surgery, how to make a feasible pathway that anybody anywhere doing surgery could successfully lower deaths. And that was what we decided to tackle. There were about 10 major things that you could do to um, reduce infections in surgery and make sure that you had um, um, problems of bleeding brought under control and good communications and all these basic things. But um, it was really meeting people who helped us understand, you know what, you really got to think about how you make these things become a reality. We zeroed in on, uh, after we brought in a team from Boeing, um, a leader who was a leader of engineering for Boeing, that we recognized you could just make a checklist for surgery. And then it was selling it. came from Boeing? The, it, very much, yeah. That's that we brought in a safety yeah. engineer who helped us understand yeah. how they work with professionals. And for Boeing, it wasn't, you know, as much regulations. Regulations create a framework that say they're expected to deliver on safety, but then they are um, the the government does not prescribe what's in a checklist. They make the checklist that makes it possible for very professional people, you know, pilots who are well trained to achieve much better results than they otherwise would. And so that became a project that, um, you know, we kept following that path. And 
as long as we were staying focused on what produces results, what saves lives, you could bring the rest of the world along. There were definitely you know, difficult moments where you, def where you had people in the profession, surgeons, uh, leaders in the field saying, this is a waste of time, it's more paperwork, it's a bad idea. But we committed to testing it at small scale, expanding it to an eight city trial, demonstrating whether it works or does not work. But once we sh began showing, I mean, we found a 47% reduction in death across eight cities. So once you had done that, then it really was, okay, how do we not commit to following through on delivering it to ever larger scale? Well, it's clearly been one of the most impactful uh, you know, advances in patient safety in, in the whole history of the movement. Uh, but I expect your, your problems then just began when people started implementing it. And I just wonder, uh, you're, you've been around long enough to know that just putting a good idea out doesn't make it happen. Uh, and uh, so I, I suspect you were prepared for some pushback and from some criticisms from your colleagues, maybe hoping that wouldn't happen. But uh, that, uh, so what happened when, it, when your article came out? and people began talking about actually putting it in place. How did those experiences go? How, how about in your own hospital, for yeah. example? Well, so it was um, you know, a great learning experience. <laughs> um, on the one hand, there were early adopters, and there were places just, you, know, you had leaders who grabbed it and ran with it and put it in their hospitals and began publishing that they were getting, replicating those results. 25%, 50% reductions in complications and deaths. Um, you had some countries like England that Man. the day after it came out, they mandated that it be implemented in the hospitals across the country. You had um, a country like the US where mm -hmm. it was still a great deal of uncertainty. I don't know that we really need this. And even in my own hospital, puzzling over like how we need to adopt this in our hospital, but how do you even convince your colleagues to make that happen? I mean, it took six months to just find a meeting where the surgeons, anesthesiologists, and nurses all sit down together and, and make plans around care. And that was reflective of where we were. We weren't even organizing ourselves as teams, and we didn't have a place to make it happen. I found a finance meeting that we could hijack, because that was the one place you could get them <laughs> together was in the finance meeting. <laughs> um, and you know, the, the um, Boston often is a place that, um, if it didn't invent it, is a late adopter. <laughs> We're necessarily, we may be slower to jump on board. And so um, it began really moving in many places. And then in Boston, it began catching on as people um, kept demonstrating and replicating the results. We also saw plenty of examples where the results did not come through. Um, in Canada, just a couple years ago, they published results when Canada mandated that the checklist be used. All the hospitals signed off. We're absolutely, we're, we're using the checklist. It's the law and we're abiding by the law. They measured three months after they had implemented and found no reduction in deaths. And our, you know, as we've peered in more closely, it's clear there wasn't a real implementation support or rollout. And we had to learn what that means. So in Scotland, they rolled it out. They mandated it, but they sent, they, they bought teams together to walk through every few months, what are you doing to roll this out? And they had coaches do site visits to say, what are the problems you're running into and let's help you solve them. They found it took them three years to create countrywide cultural change to create the adoption. But by that point, they had lowered their death rates 25%, um, enough that they documented 9,000 lives saved. Mm -hmm. So it's shown us a great deal about knowing what to do is not the same as knowing how to do it. So the first question, what do you do to lower surgical deaths? Now we knew a how. Use a checklist, much as they do in aviation. How do you get people to use a checklist was another puzzle. And over the years, what we found is it's a combination of really needing, you can't just pay them or create a regulation that says you have to do it. You have to recognize it's a culture change and walk people hand in hand through a hospital process, a team process, where they can get everybody on board with making a very complex change, even though it seems like a simple two-minute checklist shouldn't be so complicated. So it's really about culture change, not, not just ticking off the boxes. Yeah, and leadership. So, you know, 
surgeons are used to the idea that no one tells us what to do about the way we do our operations. Captain of the ship. Captain of the ship, and I make the rules. Right. Um, the idea that there would be a standardized way for any component of the way that we do things, the way we communicate, the way we plan, the way we work together as a team, that's what the checklist was really doing, was saying we're going to have a scripted way that we discuss what the goals of the operation are, how we were going to get it done. And that was the culture change, to go from cowboys to pit crews, mm -hmm. where we would agree we would really be a pit crew for the patient. And that, I'm finding, is true across many problems in public health. Exactly as we've spread our work into trying to figure out how do you make change for childbirth, or how do you make change for people's end of life care, at the beginning of life and end of life has been other projects we've gotten involved in. It's been again this idea that um, there are known ways that you can be more effective, and can we make it easy for people to adopt those known mm -hmm. ways effectively? And if we show that it works, then you kinda gotta do it. <laughs> and, that's, and that's a hard place to come to. That's a basic lesson for all the things we're trying to do in patient safety. Uh, one area I want to ask you about is something I think many people in the audience may not be familiar with, and that is what I think is one of your most important leadership contributions, which was the founding of the Ariadne Labs. Uh, the Ariadne Labs, uh, I will read from the mission statement so I get it <laughs> correct, and then ask you, what's this all about? Um, our mission is to create scalable, healthcare solutions that produce better care at the most critical moments in people's lives everywhere. And then they go on to state, and I think this is a particularly fascinating part, it is not enough to research a problem and launch a program. At Ariadne Labs, we go further. We ensure that our programs can be effectively adapted and successfully implemented across thousands of healthcare facilities and diverse cultures. Wow. <laughs> Tell us how that came about and tell us the pitfalls in trying to do such an ambitious project. I think it came out of that World Health Organization experience that you could identify ways the system fails, you could identify approaches that simplified it through research and discovery and innovation, but if all we did was publish an article in 2009 in the New England Journal saying we ran a nice trial and um, and please everybody adopt this, not very much would have happened. Right. And we really had to embark on learning the science of how do you evaluate of how, how you bring something to scale. And so that has meant now moving from saying, okay, can we make this work in a very controlled, pretty limited eight, eight hospital trial in eight cities, to saying, you know, we created a partnership a year or two after that in the state of South Carolina um, with all of the hospitals in the state trying to measure what their death rates were and how to bring this capability across the, across the state and why some places were succeeding and other places weren't. We had another partnership with the Washington State Hospital Association, another one with the country of New Zealand, and it was very interesting. In Washington State, they worked with their insurers and they paid doctors and hospitals to adopt. In New Zealand, they regulated it and made it a mandate in regulation and law. South Carolina, being a red state did not want to make it a mandate in law. Being a state that wasn't as wealthy as Washington State, they didn't want to pay for it. So we used a social networking approach where we tried um, sending a, a team of people, just four people around the state, to create partnerships in every hospital with surgeons, anesthesiologists, and nurses willing to work together to bring it into their hospitals. And the striking thing was that um, simply paying doctors or regulating wasn't nearly as effective as going forward with the social networking approach. Yeah. And those kinds of discoveries led us to want to launch a lab because we could bring those capabilities not to just a sequence of a serial set of projects, but we could launch ones in parallel fields. In surgery, yes, where we've expanded the range of things we're doing in the field, but then in childbirth, how how we can make improvements at the beginning of life and how you can make improvements at the end of life in a palliative care program. And there you were, you know, we were positing the idea that with attracting people across the whole city doing work to make changes to improve health systems and try to bring them to scale, we would find people who had common cause in wanting to do it. So we launched projects, but we also are building a community, you know, a community now that has a couple hundred 
researchers and people from across the city, 45 associate faculty members who are building work in these areas and now creating projects well beyond anything that I'm even necessarily involved with. You know, people solving everything from how do we reduce C-section rates in the country to um, how do we bring behavioral and mental health care that really doesn't get to 75% of the population with any kind of appropriate depth. How do we get that scaling up and working? Can technology make a difference? Those kinds of things. It's really impressive, and I'm sure it's the wave of the future. Uh, I think our time for, for you and me is up. It's <laughs> time to have questions from the audience, and uh, raise your hand, and we'll have you um, ask a tool, anything you want. Yes. Hi, I'm Vincent James. Thank you for your remarks. My question is, do you feel that your theory can be adaptable to doctor-patient health care in terms of one-to-one -one or the medic centers that are around the country with a lot of large volume of people? Um, so your question is, um, do our ideas have application to um, people really outside the hospital in the ambulatory setting where it's more one-to-one -one in clinics rather than having a team like in an operating room or in a child delivery. Well, we're learning that in our, child, in our um, end of life work. Um, the gap that we're seeing in care for people facing serious illness, not even necessarily at the end of life, is that um, as care escalates but produces but, but comes up against the limits of people's lives, um, people often end up with care that's completely unaligned with their actual goals and wishes. But the failure to make their wishes known before they got to the hospital in crisis, before they were ending up in surgery, before they were in an, in an emergency room um, in delir delirious with pain, is that you had to make a system that could work upstream in the doctor's office. We design an approach which is now deploying at a small scale in the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and in the um, primary care uh, practices affiliated with the Brigham, uh, the hospital I practice at, where it, it is simply saying that when the doctor and the patient sit down, they would ha ask a few key questions that palliative care experts have demonstrated to be really powerful, but we don't do. Those kinds of questions are things like, um, asking people, what's your understanding of where you are with your health or your illness at this time? Do you want to have more information about where things might be going in the future with your disease? What are your fears for the future? What are your goals and priorities if time were short or your health worsened? What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you not willing to sacrifice? So it's, we call it the seven questions approach. Bringing those questions into the clinic and operationalizing them meant creating a system that tried to make it easy for a doctor to know which of their patients are at the highest risk of dying in the next year, identifying those patients for them on their clinic schedule, and then giving them reminders, you know, it's been two visits and you haven't had this conversation and they're in danger of heading into a crisis. Could you do that? And we found we're able to make it work. So far in this still small-scale pilot. Still, it's thousands of patients. I mean, it's not that small-scale. We have 60 percent of the primary care patients in Medi on Medicare in, in, the, in one and 80 percent of the cancer patients in the other. Um, you know, two reminders, we're getting 90 percent of the patients having a conversation that up till now less than 30 percent were having the conversation. We're trying to see what the impact is and then figure out how to bring it to more places. So, I think we're learning how to bring it out of the hospital to smaller teams with less resources, but still really important roles and places in care. Okay. Hi, I'm Jessica Lang. Uh, so police officers are like surgeons and pilots in that they have to make split second decisions under stressful circumstances and errors have deadly consequences. I'm wondering if you could envision the, the safety checklist approach being used to train police officers to reduce wrongful shootings. So. Um, this is so cool. Ed Davis, the, <laughs> the chief of police, um, in, uh, for, he just stepped down from being chief of police. He was chief of police through the marathon bombing. Um, he uh, had come to us around creating a homicide 
checklist. So I don't know yet about how you might apply it in wrongful shootings, but he applied <coughs> it to homicide investigations and found inc incredible value. Um, Boston had one of the lowest clearance rates for homicide investigations in the country, and they followed and mirrored the approach we followed with surgery. They gathered a lot of information from how other police departments did it, tried to figure out what those police departments thought were their best practices, and then they created a checklist for homicide investigators. And he said there were things on there like, you know, in many cities, um, uh, in Boston it's up to the crime scene, uh, up to the homicide investigator whether they bring a crime scene investigator, a CSI, to gather evidence in a really structured way or whether they do it themselves. Um, it's up to their discretion. In other cities, they always have a, a CSI on scene. And they found that one of the reasons why in Boston they had failures was that they didn't gather the evidence appropriately and now you lost your evidence and it made it hard to reach a conviction or a clearance on what actually happened. So that's just one of several steps that they identified and they were able to make it go and then they were able to walk through the hard process. How do you convince surgeons? Well, how do you convince homicide investigators to not do things their own way, whatever way? And they just mirrored the way it went. And now there's a National Institute of Justice study, a randomized trial, evaluating whether this is what all cities should do because it's worked phenomenally well in Boston. So I think that you know, people have brought that approach to successfully reducing um, domestic abuse deaths with what police should do in, with domestic violence um, victims. And I think in wrongful shooting that taking these approaches, that these are probably fundamentally systems failures rather than failures of character of policemen, and that taking it seriously as a research and innovation need, as a systems need, I'm pretty sure would work as well. Hi, my name is Ariella Orcabi. I'm a geriatrician, and I want to thank you so much for uh, your book, Being Mortal, and just bringing culture change to the, to the general public. Um, my question for you is actually, what can we do for nursing homes from a policy level, they sort of you know, keep getting left out with the SGR uh, repeal now. Nursing homes still are left out of Medicare's conversation. Just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so the surprise to me as I was writing Being Mortal, my most recent book, um, I thought it was going to be about end of life, but what it was really about, two thirds of the book ended up being about aging and care of um, elder care, especially housing care. And I realized that there comes a moment in your life when either because of illness or frailty or other conditions, um, you, uh, you need help of others. You need to depend on them. And if, you, if they're not clear about what your goals are, um, it's a problem. The assumption in the medical world is your number one goal is to survive and be, and, and, um, and be healthy. Um, but in fact, most people in their lives demonstrate ways in which, you know, go to your refrigerator and you're making choices all the time about sacrifices that you make around what might be ideal for your health. You go into nursing homes and you'll have a medically prescribed, very healthy diet and no say over what you get to eat in, in many circumstances. You know, I'd meet an 85-year-old Alzheimer's patient who's hoarding cookies, hiding them in their room because they're under medically ordered diets that say you can only eat pureed foods, and they were miserable. And no one was asking, what matters in your life? And sometimes they blamed policy, the nursing home administrators. They'd say, well, the policies and the way we're measured is, are we keeping people safe? So you get measured around the number of falls. The result is that you tell people, you know, you should stay in a wheelchair. You shouldn't even try to walk, because then you fall. But people want to try for those moments of independence and so on. So one of the things that I came across was that, you know, I think there are some policy directions which involve um, creating measures that really evaluate whether people are, in, are receiving care where people know what their priorities and, and um, what their priorities are besides just being safe. Um, and that they feel that those priorities are respected. And if there's conflict, there are n ways already within the system to allow people to you know, have 
um, uh, agreements that, that, you know what, I can eat what I want <laughs> even if it's not safe. <laughs> and um, and <coughs> that everybody can come to agreements around those kinds of things. Um, and I think making sure that that's clear and easy and can be done is really important. The further question about how to have funding and experiments in the ways we deliver care to get it closer to the home and in environments where people feel really in their, that they're in, in control, that they're in charge, I think is, is um, uh, really important. It's sort of still unclear to me, you know, what are the three or five most important policies that would help people be successful um, in protecting their autonomy as well as their safety? Uh, is still a little bit unclear. I think we're just waking up to the fact that um, most places that the elderly end up in, it's chosen by their children, their adult children. The adult children are focused, um, as one nursing home administrator said, safety is what we want for those we love, but autonomy is what we want for ourselves. And we, they never get asked, what are you doing to ensure this person gets what matters most in their life and gets to articulate what matters to them and make that part of care. So I feel like we're opening the door now to demand that and then begin having expectations around the policies that it should align with that. Our policies are focused on safety and that's important. Here you're talking to two safety researchers. But life is bigger than just aiming for safety and we haven't incorporated that into our thinking. We've medicalized that whole process and that's been a danger. Let me pick up on being mortal because although as Jessica indicated immediately went on the bestseller list and has been number one for half at least half of the time uh, and is still there and I think will be there for another year I don't think I've seen a book in in recent memory that has had as much impact as being mortal has had and um, it, one of the most impressive things to me is how it has changed the conversation and I've always thought of that as one definition of leadership that is changing the conversation on an important subject. And I think that's exactly what you had in mind. But I wanted to ask you about one other aspect, and that is you were also giving a clear message to the physician community. We've got to change the way we practice. And I'm sure you uh, realized that that was uh, going to be fraught. And I'm curious to what extent you were concerned about that and whether you've had pushback or problems with the whole idea of physicians changing the way they approach the end of life. Well, <clears throat> so my frame in anything that I'm writing is always um, to ask what should I be doing differently better next week that, um, that uh, you know, just would make me more effective in reaching the goals. And I felt really incompetent mm -hmm. dealing with people who had serious issues of aging and debility or um, terminal illness. They didn't teach you that in medical school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then going around and discovering that you know, we as a profession weren't doing some basic things that a few uh, people in very um, marginalized fields, for the most part, in our world—you know, palliative care, hospice care, nursing home care—that they knew stuff that we weren't valuing. And that basic set of values were often very simple things, like you know, recognizing that people have priorities besides just living longer, asking them what those priorities are, and then incorporating it into your plan of care. That, that when you didn't do that, it created incredible suffering. And that I could try it and do it in my own practice in ways that remarkably changed my own practice and how people felt about my care along the way. Um, that was one step. But the further step I feel like that was the wake up call was then my dad got the brain tumor that took his life. And accompanying him on physician's office visits, he's a surgeon, my mother's a doctor and I would go as well and we would feel often completely unable to understand how we can align what they're talking about with what he cared about in the time he had remaining and um, I think that allowed me to say pretty blunt things about the ways in which we fail because I could watch how there were moments when people did incredible things for him that were completely in the, aligned with what he needed and pushed him to do things that were the right things to push him. But when they didn't understand him, it led to really pretty awful care. And saying it, um, uh, I didn't 
I often, when I'm writing, I'm not thinking enough <laughs> about how people might react. <laughs> but when I'm revising, <laughs> I start getting worried. And then it's my editor saying, no, don't, don't tone that down. Say it. You said it before. Just say it. And, um, uh, and I do always worry when it goes out, will people receive it in the way that I'm describing it, which is as someone wondering how I might be getting better and what that means about how we all might be better. Um, at what we're doing, and uh, and the pushback has not been there. No, um, no. I, I feel really lucky that people, <clears throat> for the most part, with my writing and research, have received it with the intention I had in mind. I'm sometimes saying hard things, even about even for myself, to confront the ways that um, my own uh, practice or my own um, ways of being in the world are not always the best, and um, and so. That that um, I worry about it. Um, maybe that does make me revise extra carefully for n not creating this interpretation. Um, and so far, I've lucked out that it hasn't um, come back to bite me. I, I got a note just this, you know, the, this kind of note came last week from a cardiologist who does uh, in Michigan who uh, does um, uh, you know interventional cardiology. So you know. A gung ho cowboy, just like any other, like a surgeon, like me, and um, and had someone sent in from a nursing home where where the family was very unhappy with the opinions of two previous cardiologists, mm -hmm. and had just read the book, and just said, well, let me just ask them, what are what are what what is ask the ninety year old patient, what are your goals, what's most important to you, and then ask the family, and realized they weren't in line, and then got them in line and then concluded that what she really wanted was that the remaining time she had was spent with a better quality of life, that she got some better food in her nursing home, and had no interest in going through the catheterization. And for him, that was a, a revelation. And this was a chief of cardiology. And the fact that he wrote that note and sent it along to me, it just made my day. It made my, like that was where I felt like we were connecting, we were talking the same language, we actually have the same values. We just, you know, had been doing it differently and could arrive in the same place. You got them to ask the right question. Are there questions? Back. Hi, my name is Angela Nee, and I'm a master's student in the Health Policy Management Program here. And you wrote a very provocative piece about the use of coaches, personal and professional coaches, to help top performers get to the top of their game, not just in music and uh, um, athletes, but also for doctors. And I wonder, have you seen sort of perceptions around coaches change since you wrote that piece and found ways to integrate the use of coaches in some of your projects and ongoing work? So there's two different answers there. One is that I've been disappointed about, the, um, about that piece not creating a wave in quite the same way. I think there's been a ton of individual interest, but people haven't figured out how to operationalize the idea. So the core concept was I was contrasting the notion of a kind of the pedagogical model, model we have in most of healthcare and in many fields, law, judges, all kinds of fields, teachers, that the expectations, you get lots of training in the beginning, you get some experience, you get your 10,000 hours, and then you're kind of, you go out in the world and you're expected to improve yourself for the rest of your career. Whereas um, athletes do not believe that. You know, Rafael Nadal, Djokovic, number one players in the world, have coaches for their entire career because they don't believe they can dissect and improve themselves as well. Um, I uh, ended up um, experimenting with having a coach, a former professor of mine, I'm at mid-career, felt like I wasn't getting any better. I was feeling like I was very good. I felt like I was where I should be as a surgeon. Um, but I experimented with having them come to the operating room and just watching me operate and giving me some feedback. And you know, afterwards, he had 20 different things that he pointed out that I could be doing better. <laughs> and I spent the next year gradually whittling away at doing it. And I found my complication drop rates dropped even further. And um, the idea that you need externalizing ears and that there are ways of getting feedback that allow you to keep climbing in, as you go through the middle part of your profession and beyond, um, that still hasn't quite caught on in medicine. There are places that are now 
have really introduced coaches for people in their first couple years of practice or for people in the training phase. But the idea that you need these at later stages, you know, most CEOs have coaches, they've accepted that, but it hasn't come to these other professions. It's starting to happen though. I just did a, you know, there's a, uh, one group that spun out of that article was that um, the Massachusetts judges, so there's over 200 judges across the state, created a program they called Judge to Judge based on that article which is awesome. <laughs> and that's where senior people in the, on the bench will go and observe other, coach, other judges as they handle their juries, as they um, interact and give them feedback, let them see themselves in ways that they don't. They even use videotape in that um, program. And it's fascinating to see, you know, you have people who are members of the Supreme Judicial Council, our Supreme Court in the state, who are going through this program and accepting that kind of approach. So I think we're, we're not quite there. Um, now, in our program, in our laboratory, Ariadne Labs, we use coaching very regularly, that it's the most important tool, we think, for reaching scale. It's often coaching leaders in places trying to implement difficult programs, whether it's a checklist in surgery or an end-of-life project or um, in northern India a program that is um, trying to reduce deaths in childbirth. And we're teaching nurses to coach nurses, nurses doctors to coach doctors, and, um, and, uh, and trying to make it work. A question in front? Oh, yeah. Yes. So I'm Emily George, and um, I know most of your books have been in the healthcare field. And I was just wondering if you had ideas outside of healthcare, if you had all the time in the world, what you would write about? <laughs> well, first of all, she's not a plant, but she works at Ariadne Labs <laughs> as a coach. Uh, working, so, so she's part of a team of just two people who are coaching 520 ambulatory surgery centers around the country to adopt effectively the safe surgery work we've done in outpatient surgery clinics that don't have all the advantages of hospitals. And so really interesting, great work they're doing. What would I write about if it was outside of medicine? You know, I don't really know. I, to me, I get this little window on the world, and I can use medicine to illuminate almost anything because you see human beings coming in, and it's everything from how do we, um, what kind of career do you have, to um, what is suffering, and what do people go through, or how does the brain work? You know, I, I feel like there's very little of the world I can't capture politics, global. Um, uh, globalism, um, you know, various kinds of phenomena. So I love that it gives me the full range. And I'd feel really inexpert in most other fields. But I'm, my one place, I grew up a tennis player uh, playing competitive tennis, and, um, uh, and I don't do it so much anymore. But I feel like it's a world that I have a little window into, and I could imagine trying something around something like that. Um, uh, or maybe around writing. Um, but there's so many people who fill pages with writing about sports and writing about writing <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that I feel like I get this unique vantage point through um, the eyes of both trying to practice surgery, trying to do public mm -hmm. health, trying to lead a small organization that, um, that I have a list this long and I'm never going to get through it in my lifetime. So I probably won't be writing my tennis piece. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Edward Mell, I'm an MPH student. Um, I was wondering, obviously you left a kind of burgeoning career in politics at a fairly early stage. In terms of personal impact using your career, and I appreciate this might be quite hard to give an accurate read of, but do you feel that you've had more impact in public health or you may have had or being able to have more impact in politics if you had carried on and developed that career? Well, I think it's partly, it's trying to be a little bit honest with yourself about what you're good at and also what you have tolerance for. So um, I love trying out ideas that are kind of a little bit on the edge. And I'm impatient often, as my team will tell me, <laughs> with trying to bring everybody along. Um, and, uh, and so, Entering politics is all around being able to try to persuade really a very broad swath of people to come along. 
I love working with the early adopters who want to drive something forward and then use a pull, like, come with me, come with me, let's, let's, let's do this. Um, uh, and I also was very impatient with the, with the irrationality of politics, um, the ways in which you were trying to get lots of people who fundamentally disagreed on values or were really arguing about something else and it was just power. And being effective in dealing with people whose primary aim is power, I'm, I, I was not that great at it, and, um, and I didn't love it. So Bill Clinton, working for him, you could see he loved an enemy. He loved the battle. He loved somebody who was really going after him, and he could, it, it energized him, and it, where it depressed me. <laughs> and maybe I'll change over time as I get more confidence in being able to take that on. But um, dealing with a world that is going to attack you from every possible, you know, I had little glimpses of it. So, for example, when I wrote an article about McAllen, Texas being the most expensive, one of the most expensive counties for healthcare in America, um, you know, some of the attacks that came were around you know, insinuating that I'm a Muslim who is raising, has connections to terrorists and was really um, uh, trying, to, um, uh, trying to harm people in this county in Texas. And it was floated, you know, first of all, then how do you respond? Like, well, it's not bad if I'm a Muslim. I don't happen to be, but how, so how do you even answer that? And then you're getting caught in that whole thing and then you're just buying into the whole line of argument. Um, it was, um, you know, the kind of stuff I hate, <laughs> rather than fired up like, okay, we got a battle, we're on. <laughs> so I think I was, I've been about as effective as I could be considering my personality. Um, and what I hope is that over time I learned to be effective. You know, when I first worked in government, I ended up really resigning and stepping down out of frustration with um, the power politics um, and just, you know, if we just did it rationally, we'd be all okay. <laughs> um, to you know, finding some of that when working with the WHO and just being able to relax enough to let the politics happen, let the ups and downs and get some patience with it. Not enough that I could enjoy some of the power plays that can go on, um, but maybe in another 10 years I'll get better at that. Um, so I feel like that's a, a real area that I'd like to learn how to deal with more effectively. Well, it's all sadly our time is coming to an end. So we ask you in the last couple minutes if you could sum up what you, th what you would like to have the audience take away from this, and hmm. particularly in terms of leadership. Um, well, one thing I would say, which we didn't talk much about, but struck me when um, another <coughs> friend of ours in patient safety, Bob Wachter, and I had a conversation about this. And, and um, what he pointed out was that it's very different trying to figure out how you lead when you're under 40 and then how you lead when you're over 40. And his basic rule, and I like this rule because I think I followed it intuitively, was say yes to everything when you're under 40. And then start saying no to pretty much everything after you're 40. <laughs> but that you get this <clears throat> tremendous experience from just trying things out and saying yes to almost everything. You never quite get the priorities right and you don't get the balance right and all of those kinds of things. You burn the candle at all ends. But that was um, what gave me uh, tremendous entree. I just said yes to everything. And I ended up working in Little Rock, and I ended up writing for The New Yorker, and doing all these kinds of things. And now I'm trying to figure out how do you, you know, be sane and balance it and, and achieve the things that you can achieve. And that comes from a different kind of leadership, which I'm trying to learn how to express at this later stage. Somehow I think you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful.